back uh, with you, my friends at the uh, Confederation of uh, Greater Toronto Chinese Business Associations from, if I'm not mistaken, Richmond Hill, Mississauga, uh, Scarborough, and Toronto, right? All right, well, I've been to your galas and dinners many times. I know about your many activities, so it's wonderful to see you all bearing down on important issues about the regional and national economies uh, today. Uh, and uh, I will speak for a little bit and hope to take your questions, beginning by noting that uh, I was just with the Prime Minister yesterday afternoon when he was leaving to go to China, where he'll be for the next uh, three days <laughs> before coming back to Canada for Remembrance Day, and then going to Australia, if you can believe it, for the G20 meeting. I, I'm glad I don't have his job. Um, and uh, so he'll be, uh, 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 this will be his uh, fourth official visit uh, to China, where he is, he's going there with an important delegation of ministers, including the ministers of trade and industry, and uh, a number of important Canadian business leaders uh, and uh, some members of the Canadian Chinese community, especially uh, from uh, those who are involved in uh, trade and export with, uh, with China. So uh, stay tuned for that and for uh, important announcements. As you know, uh, the government of Canada just recently ratified the Canada-China Foreign Investment Protection and Pro Promotion Agreement, uh, which helps to ensure the protection of Canadian investments uh, in China. We all know that China does not enjoy the same uh, protection for investors, especially foreign investors, uh, that, uh, that, excuse me, that Canadian investors don't enjoy the protections in China that we afford to foreign investors here in Canada. So this levels the playing field. It basically means that if a Canadian investor in China um, is uh, subject to illegal treatment, that if uh, they, they can now actually ensure that uh, there is recourse, that there is redress available to them, that they can go to the courts and have enforceable uh, decisions to protect themselves. So this is very important in terms of uh, leveling the playing field. Uh, of course, uh, Canada-China trade has grown very substantially um, in the past decade, continues to grow in important ways to over $60 billion a year bilateral trade. Um, but uh, we want to ensure that that relationship works to Canada's interest. I heard you just talking about uh, trade deficits. The truth is that we have one of the largest trade deficits with, with any country is with China. We need to turn that around and we need to see uh, better access to the Chinese market uh, for the kinds of things that Canadians sell, including our services, including financial, and, uh, financial services. Um, so if this is just a one-way relationship where China and China sells uh, predominantly lower cost manufactured goods to Canada, uh, and Canada typically only sells commodities which are very price sensitive uh, to China, it doesn't really work in our long-term interests. So one of the reasons for the Prime Minister's visit is once again is to uh, address some of those issues uh, so that there's a balance uh, in the relationship and where Canada is more assertive about its uh, interests as well as its values. So stay tuned for that. But I'm here today to talk to you in my capacity as Minister for Employment. And in that regard, uh, let me tell you that, uh, you know, we are very fortunate in Canada. You just heard, I think, a pretty balanced presentation on the state of our economy uh, from TD Bank. Uh, one thing we have to do as Canadians is to take a step back and look at how we are doing relative to the rest of the developed world. Uh, you know, the developed world, uh, the highly industrialized countries, are all facing a common challenge, which is the demographic shift, the big uh, change in our population structure that we've all been reading about for the past many years. And that's becoming very acute now, particularly in many European countries, or in Japan, which have had less than a replacement birth rate for several decades, and the, the, the consequences of which are now coming evident. That is to say their workforces are shrinking, elderly populations are growing, meaning there are fewer workers and taxpayers to pay for the social benefits, pensions, and health care of the growing population of seniors, the old demographic pyramid of a large uh, population of young people supporting a small population of old people is being inverted. 
and now a small population of young people are beginning to support a large population of old people. And there are a lot of reasons for the, of course, the 2008-09 crisis, uh, part of which was irresponsibility and financial markets in the United States. But the countries that were hardest and longest hit in the global economic downturn were those countries uh, that were that are have these most serious demographic crises, particularly, for example, in Southern Europe, in Italy and Greece, um, and and Spain, where they've had the biggest demographic shift. So, uh, and we all know that one of the reasons that there's concern about uh, the diminishing growth levels in the Chinese economy is because of a similar demographic change that is. Bit, you know, it's still, a, and of course, an enormous and, and, and growing population, but that's beginning to change as a consequence of the one-child policy, and as the population begins to diminish, demand diminishes, and people are always already looking, for, looking toward that, which is one of the reasons we see concerns about long-term growth trends um, in China. So let me talk about this in the Canadian context. We do have a growing population, but... Uh, we are just on the cusp of hitting the demographic shift in Canada. Um, depending on which statistic you look at, sometime in the next five years, there will be fewer Canadian workers entering the workforce than there are people going into retirement. So more people will be leaving the workforce to go into retirement, go on holidays and receive pensions and, uh, and not contribute to the tax base in most cases but become heavy users of the healthcare system as they get older, but fewer people coming into the workforce out of their teens. And uh, so we will be facing this crisis as well. But we're facing that in a context of what is actually a pretty dynamic economy. Canada, gratefully, had one of the shortest and shallowest recessions during the global economic downturn. We were one of the last major economies to go into it and one of the first ones to come out of it. And since the 2009 downturn, we have had one of the strongest labor market recoveries in the developed world. We have seen the creation of over 1.2 million net new jobs since the 2009 global recession. And most of those are full-time jobs in good paying occupations. Uh, and of course, we have a lot of other fundamentals very right. We have a strong fiscal policy. Unlike those European countries, not, not only are they hitting the demographic shift now, but they massively overspent, even when times were good, even when they were enjoying 3% growth rates. They massively overspent, even when their populations were still relatively young, and accrued enormous government debts, which have to be serviced, and which, have, which force high levels of taxation, which of course is a disincentive to investment and, and so and growth. But in Canada, we took a different approach. Thankfully, provincial and federal governments in the 1990s began to get their fiscal house in order, and we have continued that work. We were the we will this year be the one of the first major developed economies in the world to balance our federal budget. And I can commit to you that when the finance minister Joe Oliver member of parliament from Toronto, stands up in the House of Commons in February of next year, he will be announcing a balanced budget. And that's an important signal to send. I mean, in some technical sense, maybe it doesn't matter a great deal whether we have a $1 billion surplus or a $1 billion deficit, but it sends an important message that we are committed to living within our means to fiscal responsibility. That sends a message that taxes will be stable or going under our government's leadership going down, and that um, uh, and, and that the public sector, the state, will be crowding at the private sector when it comes to borrowing, and just a good, sound economic management. So we'll be balancing the budget um, with one of the lowest levels of public indebtedness of any national government in the developed world. Our public, our current debt to GDP ratio is around. 25%, it used to be up to 65%. In many developed countries now, it's over 100%. So we have one of the lowest relative levels of 
public indebtedness at the national level. Let me just, if I could make a little, uh, a little uh, comment on the side here. You guys here in Ontario have a problem, a very big problem at Queen's Park. You have the only government in Canada that doesn't seem to believe that balancing budgets are important. And uh, in fact, the Ontario uh, deficit, I mean, how can this possibly be that a province with 13 million people has a deficit four times larger than the national government with a population of 36 million people? And, there, and the debt keeps going up year after year, and with that debt, that means ta future taxes are going up, and that is a signal to potential investors. I don't want to down talk the Ontario economy because there are a lot of great things going on here that we are contributing to. But I invite you as business leaders to encourage your provincial politicians from whatever party to not make the mistakes of those European governments, right? To be fiscally responsible. To create, ins not, not through speeches, but through poli fiscal policies, real incentives for investment, uh, wealth creation, and work. Instead of getting in the way of a private sector economic development through higher electricity prices, higher regulations, higher taxes, higher debt and deficit. So we need all provincial governments in Canada rowing, all governments rowing in the same direction towards balanced budgets so we're prepared for the demographic change in the future. Fiscal responsibility, restrained spending that balanced budgets are predicated on, lower taxes, deregulation, less rate take, incentives for investment, uh, and, uh, and that's the direction in which we need to go. I believe nationally we are, which again is why we've seen pretty strong uh, um, employment growth. Now, it's true that in the last year, that's taped, last uh, 18 months, that has tapered off in terms of growth of jobs in Canada, and I will address that uh, in a minute. But overall, we're doing well. In fact, the New York Times has said that Canada's after-tax middle-class incomes are now the highest in the world for the first time in modern economic history, surpassing those of the United States, which is a phenomenal achievement. Um, the World Economic Forum has rated Canada's banks and financial institutions as being the most stable for seven straight years. Uh, Bloomberg, said this year that Canada has gone from six, the sixth uh, most attractive destination for business to the second most attractive destination for business. Forbes magazine said this year that Canada is the best major country in the world in which to start a new business. The International Monetary Fund and the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development expect Canada to be, among, to be among the strongest growing economies of the G7 this year and next. So those are all signs that we're on the right track here. Oh, by the way, while maintaining relatively low debt levels, getting to a balanced budget, we've also done that at the federal level without raising taxes, and to the contrary, while cutting taxes. And I think this is not a coincidence. I used to be formerly head of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation, whose purpose is to fight for lower taxes. And I, I ran that organization because I know, I don't just believe, I know that tax, high taxes are punish wealth creation. High taxes punish the kind of risk-taking entrepreneurship that creates wealth, that is so typical of the businesses and members represented in the Chinese community. You know that 90% of new jobs in Canada are created by small and medium-sized businesses? These are, these are companies, these are businesses that don't have enormous payrolls. These are companies that often operate on small margins that, and, and, and where the risk is often owned by one person or one family or a small group of people. I think a lot of you in this room know what I'm talking about. Those businesses do not survive from month to month, let alone year to year, if you're not able to, uh, to grow. And if governments come in, and punish your success through high business taxes, high personal income taxes. They drive away demand through high uh, consumption taxes. If they punish 
uh, capital gains through high capital gains taxes, if they handicap and, uh, and, and shackle and uh, handcuff uh, wealth creation through constant additions to regul the regulatory burden, if they pursue irresponsible policies, for example, to drive up costs like for electricity, how can you operate as a small business? We believe the federal government, the government of Prime Minister Harper believes, our core belief is this, that the way to create a environment of growth, of, 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 to attract investment and risk taking, is to lower the tax and regulatory burden on businesses. And that is exactly what we have done. We have cut taxes over the past eight years by uh, 170 times, by over $200 billion cumulatively, by uh, about 25 to $30 billion a year now, versus where the taxes would have been had we not reduced the levels they were at in 2006. We cut the GST from 7 to 6 to 5%. We cut corporate taxes. Um, which was very politically risky, by the way. I, I'll be a little bit political about this and point out that we had to run in three elections where other parties were criticizing us for, quote, giving money away to big businesses. I can never understand the mentality of those who say that if you don't take something from an employer or a taxpayer, you're somehow giving it to them. No, it's their money to begin with. We're letting employers, wealth creators, businesses, entrepreneurs keep more of what they earn through their hard work so they can reinvest it and hire more Canadians. So we've cut the corporate income tax rate, meaning that Canada now has an average corporate tax rate of 25%, which is one of the lowest in the developed world. And depending on which US state you're in, it's about 10 points lower than on average in the United States, which is why Forbes said Canada is now the best place, of, best major country in the world in which uh, to start a new business. And we've cut taxes even more for small businesses. We've cut payroll taxes like the EI premiums. And you know, as you know, we just announced a new uh, higher, a new credit for small businesses in, uh, who pay EI premiums. We cut personal income taxes. We raised the basic personal exemption and the spousal equivalent. We cut the basic personal income tax rate. And last week, as you know, the Prime Minister announced a huge package of additional uh, tax cuts uh, for families that amounting to, on average, about $1,200 for a family of four. Um, in addition to cuts that have represented $3,400 less in federal taxes for a family of four. Altogether, altogether, these dozens of tax cuts mean that the federal tax burden as a share of our gross domestic product is now at its lowest level, about 14% of GDP, it's at its lowest level since 1964. So imagine, other economies, massive debts and deficits, taxes are going up, driving business out, punishing innovation and investment. In Canada, we have a virtuous cycle instead of a vicious cycle. Balancing the budget, restraining spending, cutting taxes, and encouraging investment. So I think that's good news uh, for all of us. And on top of that, as was mentioned by a representative from TD, um, Canada has always been a trading economy. We, our economy has always been driven by exports. Um, typically, uh, nearly half, well, 40% of our GDP uh, is based on trade. The problem was that Historically, in that post-war period, 80% of that trade was between Canada and the United States. Well, that was, a, that was both a blessing and a curse. The blessing was we had close access to the biggest and richest market in the world, access which we deepened with the free trade agreement. But the curse is that when the United States caught the sneeze, Canada caught the cold, that we were too dependent, too exposed, to the state of one economy rather than diversifying our, the risk in our export markets. Now, a lot of governments used to talk about this problem. A lot of governments used to play on an anti-American theme in Canadian politics and 
saying we shouldn't have free trade with the Americans, we have to diversify trade, but they didn't do anything about it. And I know, for example, 1993 to 2005, Canada signed four trade agreements, all of them with very small countries like Costa Rica. But since 2006, the Prime Minister has understood the, that this is hugely important to our future. And that is why we have since pursued and signed free trade agreements with 44 additional countries. So we have increased by a factor of 10 the number of countries with whom Canada has free trade agreements. We now have uh, trade agreements with economies that represent over 50% of world GDP. With the United States, and now, as you know, the Prime Minister uh, 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 three weeks ago signed the uh, final text of the Canada-Europe Trade Agreement, which gives us virtually tariff-free access on both goods and services, hugely important, goods and services to a developed economy of 27 countries with 500 million people, making Canada the only country with tariff-free access to the United States and Mexico and the European Union, making us, once that agreement is ratified next year, a key linchpin in global supply chains. In addition to which, the Prime Minister three weeks ago signed with the President of Korea, Canada's first ever free trade agreement with a Korean country, excuse me, with, a, with an Asian country, a, a, an Asian country that is one of the most innovative and wealthiest in the world. And of course, we're continuing, as I had said at the beginning, to pursue trade opportunities with China. We are in free trade negotiations with India, a market of 1.1 billion people, um, and, and dozens of other trade agreements that are, that, that are under negotiation. Now, all of this is critically important because all of the economists will tell you that the sustainability of a Canadian recovery is dependent on the expansion of our exports. But those exports, yes, the lion's share of them will go to the United States. And so we're hopeful that their recovery will, will have a positive impact here. But increasingly, we will see a diversification of our export markets. So we've got a pretty strong labor market. We've got... Uh, a balanced budget, at least at the national level, responsible fiscal policy, which sends important messages of confidence. We have low interest rates, low inflation, the lowest federal taxes in 60 years. A, 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 at least at the national level, a, we're reducing the regulatory burden with our red tape reduction efforts. We have the most stable financial institutions in the world. We have a massive program of expanding access to export markets around the world, including uh, and particularly Asia and Europe. Uh, and, and on top of that, we see a, uh, a renewal, a renaissance, of what were our traditional industries uh, in much of Canada, our commodities and extractive resource industries. You obviously can think of oil and gas in uh, Western Canada. Um, and by the way, I must say that yesterday, uh, Tuesday's elections in the United States vote very well for us because it's almost, it, it, it's very likely now that the United States Senate have, will adopt uh, a law early in 2015 to force the construction of the Keystone XL pipeline uh, from Alberta to uh, Louisiana that will allow Canada finally to get its oil, the second largest oil reserves in the world, will finally allow us to get our oil to tide water to major refineries and onto the global market so that we are price makers and not price takers, which could reduce, which could increase on average about $10 a barrel of the price that we get for Canadian oil. It's also why it's so important that we continue to pursue energy infrastructure opportunities. For example, the idea of constructing a pipeline for Canadian oil, Western Canadian oil, to supply Central and Eastern Canada. So we can get some projects like that done that will massively increase our national wealth. Um, and by the way, reduce our trade deficit. It's ridiculous. You know that, that in Central and Eastern Canada, you import 700,000 barrels of oil a day from countries like Saudi Arabia, Nigeria, and Venezuela. When Canada is a net exporter of oil, does this make any sense at all? 
So if we can just get a pipeline to refineries in central and eastern Canada of Canadian oil, right there, a huge chunk of our trade deficit will go down. We won't be buying foreign oil anymore. So all of those big investments, whether they be the oil sands or uh, mines in, from Labrador to northern British Columbia, all through the northern territories, we're looking at hundreds of billions of dollars of capital investments um, that have already been including, for example, liquefied natural gas in British Columbia, the Ring of Fire in northern Ontario. Um, now, some of these are sensitive to the softness in current commodity prices, but, uh, but fundamentally, those jobs are going to be coming on stream. And this is really what I want to focus on. Yes, unemployment is still too high in Canada at 6.7%. Yes, there are particular pockets of high unemployment, like youth unemployment at 12%. Youth unemployment in the Greater Toronto area at over 20%, I think, which is hard in some respects to, to understand, given what's happening in the Canadian economy. Um, high unemployment amongst Aboriginal Canadians. High unemployment amongst new immigrants. Those who've been in Canada for less than five years have an unemployment rate that's twice as high as the general population, et cetera. And yet, the number one problem that most employers and industry organizations report in Canada is the problem of skill and labor shortages. Isn't this a paradox? I call it the paradox of an economy that has too many jobs, too many, too many people without jobs, but too many jobs without people. Too many people without jobs, but too many jobs without people. When Alberta employers are desperate for workers across the entire skill spectrum. From entry level jobs like landscaping and food counters attendance, all the way up to advanced engineering positions and you name it. They are crying out for people, for workers in Alberta and Saskatchewan and many parts of British Columbia, in, in other parts of Canada as well. There are industries right here in the greater Toronto area who say that their biggest problem is skill and labor shortages. Like, for example, the information technology industry. It's hard to believe. But if you go down to Kitchener-Waterloo, they say that they're short 2,000 information technology workers at any given time. Uh, the computer gaming industry in Toronto complains that they don't have people with the specialized skills that they need in that multi-billion dollar industry. The film and television production industry, which is a huge industry now in this, in this area, has to fly people in from the United States every day with specialized skills that they apparently don't have here in Canada. So, and, and these challenges are only going to get worse as the population ages, as we do begin to see a shrinking in our domestic workforce. Um, in fact, the Toronto Board of Trade released a report together with United Way last month that showed that Toronto, the Toronto region alone will need to fill 520,000 new job openings in the next five years. In particular, the report identified higher demand for workers in professional, scientific, and technical jobs. Build the Force Canada, which works with the construction industry, talked about all those condos going up, requires skilled tradesmen to build them, and Build Force says we need 300,000 construction workers in the next decade. The mining industry says we need 145,000 workers in the next decade. The petroleum industry says we need 150,000. The Conference Board of Canada found out that Ontario is, did a study concluding that Ontario is losing out on about $24 billion in economic activity um, because employers can't find people with the skills that they need. Uh, and, uh, and so this is a very serious challenge. It's only going to get worse. Now, some people say, oh, we don't really have a, a labor shortage. Look, there's still a lot of unemployed people, which is true. At the national level, overall, we do not have a labor shortage. But it is equally true to anyone who bothers to get out, out of their office towers, towers in downtown Toronto and go to the real world, it is equally true that there are real, significant, growing skill and even labor shortages in certain sectors and regions that are only going to increase. And that's what every business organization in the country says. I don't believe they're all just making it up. And you know what? Let me come back to the basic fact. We know the, the workforce is going to start to shrink. 
So do you want me to wrap up? <laughs> Get to questions, I'm sorry. Um, so we know it's going to start to shrink as the population is aging. So what are we going to do about it? Let me, let me briefly summarize. For, first of all, immigration. People say, well, let's just replace all those retiring workers with, with immigrants. Great idea, but it, it's just not doable in terms of the math. According to the Conference Board of Canada, they did a study on this five, four years ago. For us to maintain the current average age of the Canadian population would require, through immigration would require that we quadruple immigration levels to uh, run them at 4% of the population, adding a, new, a million new permanent residents per year. We currently welcome, we currently are maintaining the highest per capita levels of immigration in the developed world. We're adding the equivalent of 0.8% to our population a year, 260,000 new permanent residents, in addition to a whole lot of temporary residents. And that isn't even, doesn't come close to counteracting the aging of the population. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I don't think we can realistically add a million new immigrants to Canada a year. That would mean in Toronto, going from 60,000 new immigrants a year in the GTA to a quarter of a, to, uh, yeah, about a quarter of a million. You think congestion's bad now? You want to drop a quarter of a million, a million people here over four years? I don't think that is a viable strategy. Most Canadians agree. Especially, especially when 12% of recent immigrants are unemployed. And a huge percentage are underemployed. This is another paradox. How does it make any sense that we're running high levels of immigration in an economy with skill and labor shortages, but where many immigrants end up being unemployed or underemployed? That is why, when I was Minister of Immigration, we launched a program of fundamental reform of our immigration policies to do a better job of selecting people, not just with general levels of human capital, so they would sink or swim in our labor market, but the precise kinds of skills and qualifications that will be lead to employment in Canada and to better connect prospective immigrants with employers. So, and to get a better geographic distribution of immigrants. So that is the objective of immigration reform, to go from a supply-driven system where people were taking eight years to get their applications considered, to a demand-driven system where employers are participating with the government in selecting people from abroad who can fill skill gaps, and we can get them here quickly, in a matter of months rather than years. The full new system will be launched in January of next year called Express Entry. And I invite you, as the Chinese uh, Business Associations, to find out how you can participate in that. So immigration reform is critically important, but so too, and this is my last point, is reform of our training and education systems in Canada. Let me be blunt. One of the reasons we have unemployment, youth unemployment in the GTA of over 20% is because our education system is not adequately preparing young people for the jobs that exist. And I think we need to learn from better performing labor markets like Germany's, for example, at how they provide young people starting at the age of 16, typically, with experiential workplace learning where they get a trade certificate. It's two thirds of young Germans, Austrians, Swiss, go into these programs, they pay apprenticeships, they work on a work site, they get some college training as well. And after three years, they have a certificate, 95% of which, 95% of them go into the, in jobs in the fields for which they were trained when they're 19. Their youth unemployment rate is less than half of ours. Youth unemployment in Switzerland is 3% because of this system. So I think we need uh, to stop. We, we, don't, we no longer have the luxury of subsidizing everyone's educational choices regardless of their chances of getting a job. I think we need to be a little more hard-headed about providing the kind of education and training that lead to the jobs that we know will be in demand in the future. And we're working on that, supporting apprenticeship programs, the Canada Job Grant, uh, and reforming all of our federal training programs and working with the provinces on that. So I'm happy to take questions on that or anything else, and if delay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.